This week on To the Contrary. First, women breaking industry barriers. Then, can feminism sell? Behind the headlines, a foul-mouthed, tattooed Lutheran pastor says she's surprisingly traditional. Bay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, women at the top. Some fascinating developments this week about women occupying more C-suites at major corporations. Mary Barra is poised to become CEO of General Motors next month. She will become the first woman to head an automaker. The oldest insurance market in the world Lloyds of London joins the exclusive group with the appointment of Inga Beale as its first female chief executive. And at the White House, it was the women, Yahoo CEO Marissa Meyer and Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg outshining the men this week as President Obama met with tech leaders to talk about NSA privacy and the healthcare website. So, Congresswoman Norton, does this mean we're finally seeing women making strides as heads of major corporations, including in non-traditional industries? By these, this new leadership in what is surely the epitome of a man's world virtually redefines feminist breakthrough. Oh, I absolutely think especially younger women who are moving up into the ranks in these industries, you're going to start seeing a lot more women in charge at companies like this, and I think it's fantastic. It is great, but you know, when we're 50% of the population and we're only 4 to 5% of women CEOs in the Fortune 500, I don't think it's quite a windfall. I'll agree. This is a fantastic story for the purpose of women advancing, but what about diversity at the top of these corporations as well? I think that's something that ought to be talked about at the same time. Well, how much farther do we have to go, and I come to you because I know you're involved in this issue, uh, in terms of getting more women to the top? How do we do it? It, it, it? You wouldn't, but don't you think, I mean, to me, it's just amazing that GM, one of the emblematic corporations of America, is has a female CEO and a relatively young female CEO. And this isn't their only woman in leadership. In fact, in Europe, the CEO for two of the major brands, uh, Chevrolet and Cadillac, was also a woman in her 40s who uh, is a friend of mine. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of this in the old industries, in the auto industry. What is troubling to me is that Reuters just did a study of the top 10 uh, venture capital startups out of Silicon Valley, and six out of ten of them have not one woman on their board. And this is in the wake of Twitter and Facebook getting so much negative pushback when they went to their IPO without it. One of those six is Pinterest, and Pinterest has 80 percent women users. And this goes beyond judgment. This goes to, you know, what kind of naive, naivete do these uh, business people have, that they're not going to have somebody that looks like the people using their product. Well, another large problem with it, too, is if you look at the women who advanced this year into these positions, they didn't always have the most positive stories coming out about them. It wasn't rah, rah, woman at the top. It's, oh, Marissa Mayer, she's about to have a baby. Should we really put someone in charge who's about to have a baby? Jill Abramson at the New York Times. It was, you know, oh, she's a little bit pushy. Maybe, you know, she's not the right person for that job. Whereas if a man were in that job, absolutely they would be like, look at her revitalizing the New York Times. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's a, that's part of my big problem this year is it's not just the number, it's the way that they're being treated. Well, but the, the numbers, particularly in, in these, these areas where women have had to start just as men started uh, with their degrees in science, that's what fascinates me. And it may say to girls and to women, uh, what we've been trying to say for a long time when they see these women at the heads of these these companies that STEM, uh, of course, uh, the, the shorthand for science, technology, engineering, uh, engineering and, and, and math is is where it's at. Uh, cause I was very impressed with these women because they didn't they didn't they didn't sideway come in. Uh, they, they had to have two kinds of talent. 
one substantive talent in their field has to be quite extraordinary. But then they have to have leadership talent in a, in a man's world. Uh, this is the kind of breakthrough we haven't seen before. I mean, it, it redefines everything. It's very different from, you know, be, being the first senator from your state. Truly, anybody with appeal could do that. <laughs> it has to take a whole lot more uh, than that to head one of these global corporations. And, and every time it happens, it moves the ball down the field. And, and it's also made it a, a safe thing to talk about women and diverse leadership. Absolutely. Look at Christine Lagarde. When she first took over at the IMF, she never said a word about gender. I saw her at the World Economic Forum and you know, you'd see her out and about, but she was not talking about but gender in recent until this year. Yeah, in recent interviews, she's right. all about being the first female. That's exactly right. And that head. just happened this year. And Why? You, I think we're at a tipping point. I think all of these studies, Credit Suisse, we had another one out of University of California this year, uh, Bain Capital has done one. These are not feminist organizations that have come to understand that diverse leadership renders more profit. And so you can come at it as a good business strategy and you're rewarded by all kinds of stakeholders, investors, consumers, uh, and we'll see, talk about this later with the Pantene ad. Uh, you know, people are wanting to align themselves with this more progressive approach to business that makes money for you. How is it changing with your generation? I mean, is it just assumed that, uh, you know, women are going to be the CEOs of it's one day. signaling good things, and I think, yes, it's becoming more and more assumed that that is an office and that is a position that I can take. But one thing that's really troubling is that corporate boards are still stacked with people who don't look like us. <laughs> and millennials are more and more given lower ranking jobs. They're, they're not qualified enough. What do you mean enough. more and more given lower? You know, you're, you're asking for, you're knocking on the door of the C-suite, and you're told, go somewhere else. And that's take the second seat there. Don't, don't be the head. And, and I think that's the problem, is that these corporate boards need to change. This year we learned that Twitter took action after being told, hey, you don't have a woman right. <laughs> on your corporate board. How so that's a problem for that? my generation, is that we're still seeing stories like that emerge. So on one hand, we're knocking on the door thinking we're allowed in, but at the same time, we're being told to be taken But this out. is what I love. I love the millennials because <laughs> I think you are the women's movement's best friend. Well, we think everything's attainable. You are special. <laughs> Barney told you you were special, and you were special. You know, I mean, you, you grew up <laughs> thinking that you could do anything because sure. that's how the baby boomers raised you. Exactly. And I raised my girls. And I do think that they are going to manifest what we've all been talking about for so long because they're not going to take it. And they have opportunities now that are outside the traditional corporate structure and those corporations want these social media savvy millennials and I think that will be a part of this environment that's creating an opening for women and diverse leadership. But it's certainly easier though when you have other people who look like you who are out there encouraging you. you know, uh, at our company we just got our first woman CEO which was a big deal within our company and very exciting because she's been able to mentor a lot of the other women like myself and be able to tell us look this is how I got here you can get here too and it's just been a fantastic opportunity to be able to learn from another woman. All right, let us know what you think. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie Herbe. From women climbing the corporate ladder to selling feminism. A recent Pantene ad from the company's Philippines branch has sparked a great deal of controversy after unintentionally going viral via Sheryl Sandberg's own Facebook posting. The ad has generated nearly 9 million views since being published on YouTube last month. The video compares a working woman and a working man in identical settings, but with opposite labels shown, including boss versus bossy, persuasive versus pushy, neat versus vain, and so on. The ad concludes with the statement, don't let labels hold you back, be strong and shine. Sandberg touts the ad as a must-see and as, quote, one of the most powerful videos she's ever seen illustrating how when women and men do the same things, they're seen in completely different ways, end quote. Critics disagree, saying the intended feminist message fails due to unrealistic representations of women and the assertion that beautiful hair helps resolve workplace inequality. So, Rena, um, do is this ad sexist or feminist? Feminist, come on, <laughs> not sexist at all. I, I actually related to it. I found it quite uh, appealing. Well, it's selling a product. <laughs> so I thought, when can I run out and grab that Pantene? Uh -huh. No, but really, it's, it does depict something that's not 
false. It's true. Women are entering the workforce and professional companies. They're, they're young professional women that exist all everywhere around us. So it's not far off. It shows you the feminism that's taken root in this generation. I mean, who would have thought of, 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 I mean, this was the very same words that were used when feminism arose in the 1960s, but nobody would have put it in an ad. You put it in an ad because you know who you're appealing to and you know it appeals. And will it sell? That's a big question. That, 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 that I'll leave for the ad executives. You know what? This is what I was talking about earlier, where what we see is companies have figured out that if they align themselves with a more enlightened view of how business should be done and what women's role is in business, that it's actually going to help them. And I'm ready to show buy me some pants. Show, <laughs> show me examples. I mean, I can think of one, the Dove campaign, yeah. which, which is going on and on and on now for four or five years where they show real women and real in their underwear. Well, remember you know. all of the, the pink uh, appliances that were sold now for the sake well, that, of cancer. Well, that's kind yes. of silly. Isn't well, it? well yes. I think it was <laughs> rather trivial and superficial. Uh, this, I think, is, is pretty significant that, uh, you know, Gina Davis has done a lot of research on gender in the media for since uh, over the last 10, 15 years, and it's shown how the media has really undermined how women, girls, and our society in general sees women because, you know, women are sort of portrayed as eye candy and she has all the statistics to back this up and women are rarely showed in a working role certainly very rarely in a powerful role in family programming so how great to have all these ad dollars going to bringing the message forth that you know we have been fed some very uh, negative messages in the media and that we should be conscious of how we think because that's a result of this culture we're in. I certainly prefer this ad to pretty much any Victoria's Secret ad, which by the <laughs> way never shows women the way that they look. Yeah, and right. also the w those are very weird that's ads. More sexist sexist sexist. The time, yeah, yeah, those are a lot more what I those would consider sexist. sexist ads that are supposed to be reaching out to women, but yet I always l look at their ads and say, is this ad for me? Well, why, why would I ever relate to this ad? Well, but see, the, uh, what I think about Victoria's Victoria's Secret, and I don't have data, but if it's clearly aimed at men. So, are, is it are the men going to Victoria's Secret and buying the underwear for their girlfriends' wives? But they wives? expect women to go. They expect these women to want to go. But you know why? Because their man wants them to go and buy that. And that's okay. what offends me about Victoria's Secret: is oh, I should want to go here because my man wants me to come here and buy this. That's offensive. I prefer to at least be have an ad that's targeting me and the things that they at least think that I think are important. And I submit to you that this showed equality, if anything else. This showed women's equality, that she can hold her own next to this guy. Sure, it showed the terms that were showing one thing versus another, but it shed a lot of light on that. Yeah, it showed when the women were doing the exact same thing the men That's were doing, right. people were receiving it differently. And it's no surprise Cheryl would have this on her website, because this is the very reason women do not lean in. Oh, I tweeted it because right away. Because it is. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it is thought of as, as a negative. A women's success correlates with unlikability, Men's success correlates with likability. It's been shown. So I it, don't, I, I don't, I don't begrudge the hair part of it because yeah. <laughs> no matter who she is, women care more about their hair than any other part of their body. <laughs> so and to the extent that they understand this, Pantene understands this and keeps going at it. I think they're onto something. But do you? Is it? Is the psychology here that? Gosh, that's a great ad. So next time I go to the drugstore or the food sh food shopping, I'm going to I'm going to buy Pantene. Well, Does it translate? I don't know if it if it's either. Wow, that's a great ad, and you just keep buying the product you've always been brought, uh, buying. Well, full disclosure, I already use Pantene. Yeah. That's how I get this lovely hair. <laughs> um, and so I was already buying it. Um, but yes, I think after I see ads, I mean, that's the purpose of advertising, right? Yeah. Is that they want you to see an ad and then want to go out and get that product, either because they, you think you're going to have better hair or because you support the ad campaign behind it. That's the purpose of advertising. So I absolutely think more women will probably think about buying Pantene now for this, for whatever it's reason. It's front of mind. I never bought Dove. Mm -hmm. Soap until they did that campaign. Well, I think Pantene is trying. And, you, and then you and did, Yeah, and so I started buying it. I'm going to buy that. I, I think Pantene is trying to reach a broader spectrum of women. I think they've looked at, you know, who already buys, and they look at these women right. who are, have, have. New markets. Right. 
disposable income professionals. That's who they want, and that, that's what, who I think Let's they're aiming Let's not forget at. this was in the Philippines, too. This was Pantene right. Philippines, right. and the woman in the ad is actually the picture of beauty for a Filipino woman. She's fair. She's got lovely hair. She's just really the epitome of beauty for them. And by but, the way, we are below the Philippines in the gender ranking of nations of, of the World Economic Forum. <laughs> <Course, laughs> of course, of course. 23, they're <laughs> beating us. <laughs> and by the way, so does this signal an ad, an end to the ads, or has it already come where, you know, the, the car ads, for example, guy with a beautiful woman, and it's almost like buy the car and the woman comes with it. <laughs> Are we seeing an end to that? Unfortunately, I don't think so. It was just last week that the Victoria's Secret fashion show was on TV, and that's all everyone could talk about, even in the news cycle that day, which is really sad on a whole other level. But I don't, I don't, I don't think that it's going to be the end of that, but I certainly hope that we're at least moving in a better direction. Yeah, the, the ads tend to be more sexist than feminist, but I think that ad executives will be looking at whether this takes and, and, and they'll be me measuring the, the, the numbers. That's yeah. how we'll know. Let's hope it takes, and I can't wait to see the U.S. version. <laughs> Behind the headlines, a different kind of Lutheran pastor. A former stand-up comic, Nadia Boltz Weber, sports multiple tattoos and swears when she preaches. But she says her message comes straight from the Bible. I swear like a truck driver. I have a different kind of history. Nadia Boltz Weber doesn't talk or look like a typical Lutheran pastor. I have a tattoo of Mary Magdalene, the, the apostle to the apostle, she is called. She was the first witness to the resurrection, and she was the one who Jesus said to go and tell the others. This is uh, Lazarus, raised from the dead, being unbound from his grave clothes. And then I have the whole church here on this arm. I have um, sort of a creation motif here, Gabriel and Elizabeth and Zachariah, so that's Advent. There's a nativity for Christmas. That's the angel and the women at the empty tomb for Easter, and Mary and the apostles with flames on their heads for Pentecost. Boltz Weber has always had a knack for captivating an audience, but the setting wasn't always a church. Before becoming a preacher, Boltz Weber was a comedian. I mean, I actually got paid, you know, I, I, to be cynical and caustic on stage and to um, sort of just blurt out my observations about myself and the world. And I still do that in preaching, you know, in a sense. Preaching and, and comedy have certain things in common. They're having a heart attack back there going, please help her not swear. <laughs> I actually have no idea how people manage to become preachers without being stand-up comics first. She made people laugh, but she was not happy. I um, had a drug and alcohol problem and uh, I was a very angry person and I have an enormous capacity for destruction of myself and other people. Boltz Weber's life was changed, she says, by divine intervention. I ended up getting sober and it didn't feel like I pulled myself up my, by my spiritual bootstraps. And it was as though God reached down and picked me up that, and I'm like kicking and screaming, going, no, no. And God's like, that's adorable. And then he like puts me over on this other path <laughs> toward being, of all things, a Lutheran pastor. I mean, I just never would have chosen it, right? It, it was sort of thrust upon me. Boltz Weber left home and the church in her teens. She was brought up in what she calls a very sectarian fundamentalist Christian tradition, where empowering women was not part of the program. A lot of Christianity has been based in rule following, in a sense. It's a behavior program almost. Like if, if you can um, just follow these really particular rules, whether it's having a political belief or, or uh, expressing your sexuality in a certain way or your gender in a certain way, holding certain social conventions, that's what Christianity has been boiled down to. Boltz Weber says the Lutheran Church trusts and understands her, and she says her message stays true to the core of Christianity. There are ways in which our church and myself are just really traditional that I think people are counterintuitive to some people. I think people are desperate for a place where the truth is just spoken out loud, the truth about ourselves and the world and God. We don't really sugarcoat things. There's, a, there's this culture of truth-telling. This Lutheran liturgy and this Lutheran theology, the whole tradition, it is a feast. And it is a feast to be shared. And I'm here to tell you, people are hungry. So are people hungry for, uh, you know, this different kind of religion, something new, change? Or are they hungry 
um, for entertainment in church, which is really kind of what she's doing. Well, I think young people in general are more likely to listen to something if it's entertaining, but you don't have to necessarily go as far as she's going, or you don't have to be the Pope. I think that there's a happy medium, which is what you'll find in most youth groups in America these days. I've talked a lot on the show about how I moved from the Catholic Church to a non-denominational Christian because their youth group was more fun. Um, it works. It certainly works to a certain extent to get, um, to get more young people interested if there's nachos and games <laughs> and fun music, you know, and if that's what you got to do to get young people listening to the Word of God, then, you know, hallelujah. <laughs> but apparently she, she's got, she's got staid Presbyterians and Lutherans and middle class of people who you would find, if, in, if at church at all, not at that kind of church. And that's what was really intriguing ab about her. Well, I mean, she's made religion hip, and these are Protestants. Uh, remember and what, what is it about Lutheranism that appeals to, that selected her? No, no, she, she was raised as a Lutheran. Uh -huh. And and so you know when she decided to embrace Christianity as a profession, she went to to her own church. And Lutheran Lutheranism, like much of of Protestantism, is a liberal church, but it's not hip. And, and she is saying to all these Lutherans and Episcopalians and Presbyterians, uh, we can be hip too. And so she's drawing across the the age lines. People want to hear her. It's as if. For religion to regain itself, and remember, people continue to be spiritual, they continue to say they believe in God, but church attendance continues to go down. And, and she came out of a, a church environment where uh, after the age of 12, at her church, you became baptized at the age of 12, and you could no longer have a woman teaching Bible class. And so it was very much a patriarchal, hyper-conservative, church and she very much rebelled uh, and became, you know, got involved in drugs and alco alcohol and her flock at first were broken people. I mean, that was the way she looked at it. I was reading her book and, and she saw her. Which, by the way, got to almost near the top of the New York Times bestseller mm. list. Yeah, and the so way. that says a lot. And to me, it almost looked like she was uh, catering to people who sort of fell out, fell out of society. And right now, you know, we're going through That's this That's just huge like the Pope. Yeah, exactly. and the Pope too. I think with globalization, you've seen a lot of, the, the social contract has not been able to uh, hold, uh, the center is not held, and in America, you see this widening gap between the rich and poor, but you also see it all over the world in developed societies. Now, globalization's been great for emerging economies. A lot of people have been brought out of poverty, but in places like America, where you have a lot of people who have feel really kind of lost, and I think her message was aimed at them, as is the Pope's. And it's not very different from what the nuns taught me in the 60s. And it was all about forgiveness and love and compassion and not the rigid fundamentalism that I think we saw later. But do you think, you, you say, Eleanor, fewer people are going to church. Um, I certainly know more people, I've seen uh, data by a particular group that specializes in polling uh, religious people or Americans about their religious beliefs, um, that says that you know fewer people identify as a particular some sect of Chris yeah. Christianity or any other religion than in recent years. But is this kind of thing going to turn it around? No, I think this is. Uh, you can, she can call herself a Lutheran all she wants to. But in fact, she's just like those non-denominational churches, and I think she's drawing Protestants and perhaps even Catholics from, from across the board. Uh, but I, I must say, I, I think that while she may be starting something with how hip she is, uh, I don't think she's the wave of the future with her tattoos and the rest. Why not? Because I think she is really far out. And if you notice her congregation, <laughs> I mean, what's gotten her is her, is her book. Her book is, is, a, is an, an almost bestseller. It's not that she has a congregation of a thousand or two thousand the way you see on television. But well, I she do. had, when I interviewed her, she had 600, I think she mentioned. Oh, and, she says she's and, growing. Right. And I, and, I, and I find it really interesting how she's growing. She's not just growing with who you might expect to come to church. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's interesting to me. So I think there's a kind of hip phenomenon here that, you know, you don't, you're, you're not, you're, you're, you're not your, this is not your grandfather's church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we well, don't Congressman, think I'd have way. to politely disagree. I think Quickly, this is the future. I think that this is going to attract people who have questioned their religion and how rigid religion has been, no matter what you are, Christian or otherwise. I think she is compelling. Her story, her testament 
of her faith is also compelling. So she's unconventional. It sells. All right. That's it for this edition of To the Contrary. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie Urbay and at To the Contrary. And visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary, where the discussion continues. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, please join us next time. Like she came out of a bad place. Well, not entirely, right? <laughs> yeah.